started. Uh, first up, we have Professor Hall. She's a biochemistry professor, and she's going to be talking about what she does in the lab. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so my title is Chasing After Fast Propagating Phage, Effective Gene 2 Mutations in M13 Bacteriophage. So my research actually incorporates a lot of different kinds of biology, and I've, I'm not trained as a biologist, I'm trained as a chemist who learned some biology along the way. So it's good for me to have biochemistry majors who have taken a lot of biology courses, some of which I have never taken. So that's great. Um, but also, it's good for chemists to join my lab because um, there's nothing a chemist can't learn since I had to learn it so I can teach it to anybody. You don't have to know a lot of biology. So it works either way. I'm going to just try to connect this to some things that you might already know. I think everybody's heard of a virus, which is um, an agent that infects cells. And what it does um, when it infects the cells is it makes many copies of itself. You don't have to worry about the details on this slide at all. It makes many copies of itself, and then those particles come out as progeny virus particles, and then they go to infect other cells, and it just keeps going like a chain reaction. Some viruses that you, I'm um, sure, know about, influenza virus, which infects cells of the respiratory tract. And this, if this happens to you, you get um, a cold. Or um, the human uh, immunodeficiency virus, HIV, which infects cells of the immune system, and this can lead to AIDS. So what we work with are none of these types of viruses. They're not scary viruses. They don't make humans sick. It's a virus that infects um, bacteria, and we call that a bacteriophage. Most of the time, I'll just call it a phage. So just remember that a phage is a virus that infects bacteria. And the one that we work with infects E. coli, probably the most famous bacterium that I'm sure you've heard of. E. coli uh, is found in the intestines of warm-blooded animals, including humans. That's where E. coli comes from and where it lives. And so the virus that infects E. coli is also in the intestines. And it's usually isolated from sewage. <laughs> the ones that people use in the lab have been isolated from sewage. So here's a sewer cap from Munich, Germany, where the phage that we work with was found originally. It's called M13. The M is for Munich. And, um, and this is when it's long and skinny, and it infects E. coli. Now, in case you're worried, we don't work with sewage in the lab. <laughs> Everything's been purified, so it's not disgusting or gross or anything like that. So something else you might know is that um, DNA encodes all the genetic information for an organism, whether it's a bacterium or a human being. It's really the same idea. And that information encodes proteins. And proteins are the workhorses in the organism that do um, a lot of what's going on. They give you the characteristics you have. They give you the behaviors you have. And this is true whether you're a bacterium or a human being. Same idea again. If you have a change in your DNA, which we would call a mutation, then that can affect your proteins. Either one of your, one of your proteins is made incorrectly or differently, or uh, it's made correctly but in the wrong amount, too much or too little of the protein. And this can have an effect which alters your characteristics or your behavior. Sometimes it's advantageous. It actually makes the organism stronger, faster, whatever. Uh, oftentimes it's a deleterious effect, so it causes a problem in the organism like a disease. And I'm sure uh, many of us are familiar with diseases that are caused by genetic mutations. So we're working again with this bacteriophage, or phage, and it has a genome much smaller than our genome. We know everything about it. It's very simple. And we know that um, some mutations in a certain area, and we're going to say that this is near gene 2. That's all you have to know. It's near gene 2. Um, we think cause changes in the amount of a protein called protein 2 that are made by the bacteriophage. And what we know is that the phage end up faster. And when I say faster, remember how I said the, the uh, virus infects the cell and makes more copies of itself? That's what I'm talking about. The phage with the mutation is faster at making copies of itself. So the way we look at that is with a graph like this. 
Um, we'll take a culture, we'll put some E. coli cells, and then different phages, some that have the mutation, some that don't, and we'll let them grow in the cells and make copies of themselves. We try to start with about the same amount for every sample, and virions just means particles of the phage. And at the end of five hours, um, they all kind of end up at the same place because they all exhaust the cells to the same degree. But in the middle, we see a big difference. For a regular growing phage that doesn't have a mutation, we have about 10 to the 9, 5 times 10 to the 9 variants. But for the ones with mutations, about 100 times more. So this is a log scale showing concentration versus time. But in the middle, it's a, um, because of the logarithmic scale, it's actually 100 times more phage when it has a mutation compared to if it doesn't. So how many of these have we worked with? We actually just published a paper very recently with 28 different mutant clones, different um, phage with their own unique identity, but uh, there's some overlap in the mutation itself, so that we have 13 different mutations. And some are clustered, like there are three clones that have the same mutation here, and there are four that have that mutation, and there are a few other sets like that. So this paper, by the way, one of the authors is in the room, <laughs> in the back. Emily, raise your hand. She's not even listening. <laughs> this, oh, okay, she's explaining to her neighbor. Yeah, here's Emily. So Emily's a co-author on this paper with uh, six other students, two of whom just graduated, and the others from a little bit longer ago. Now, why do the mutations occur? Well, remember I told you about the sewers, right? So the original phage discovered in the sewers was called M13. The one we actually used in the lab is a version that molecular biologists changed a little bit to make it useful for certain types of experiments. And the difference is they added a big piece right here. And I won't tell you too much about it because it doesn't matter that much right now. But that big piece, two things about it. It's big, <laughs> and so it makes the genome a lot bigger, 7.2 kilobases instead of 6.4. It's just the length of that DNA genome. And it's the location of it. It's in a sensitive area. So it may affect the way the phage copies itself for one or more reasons. And we haven't figured out what those are yet. And that's part of our research. But what happened is that the, the, with that big piece, this phage grows more slowly than the original version found in the sewers, the natural version. Um, so here's the uh, engineered version, here's the original version, and what the mutations do is they allow the engineered version to be faster as if it's trying to get back to where evolution had brought the natural version uh, over, you know, zillions of years. So it's kind of like a re-evolution. It's, it's trying to get back to that fast rate of um, propagation. So that's the why. The how is what we're still working on. Um, again, we think it has something to do with that protein, too, and making more of it. And we're trying to connect that to the faster growth. So we just don't have this piece in the middle yet. We're trying to connect those dots. But I've got five students working on it right now. Uh, these three, you may recognize some of them. That's Emily again, who's in the back. And then I have um, also two, uh, these three worked in the summer. These two are working during the semester, Courtney and Abby. And uh, so that's my current group right now, uh, although two of them are graduating, so I'm going to have room soon. <laughs> And if you want to know what, what it's like to actually work in the lab, because that's an important part. If you're, you may be interested in the project, but if you don't like what you have to do with your hands every day, it may not be that fulfilling for you. So we do a lot of sterilizing of things because we need everything to to um, to be um, free of contaminants. You know, we want to just have our cells and our phage and not a bunch of other contaminants. So we do a lot of autoclaving and using the Bunsen burner to sterilize. Um, things and um, we have lots of samples, lots of little tubes that have what looks like water in them so you have to use your imagination a lot like okay this tube has DNA and this tube has uh, protein and this tube has cells. It all, a lot of it looks the same and we have to keep track of it all. So if you like organizing and keeping track of things this is the lab for you. We also read a lot of 
former students' lab notebooks because we have to go see what they did and we have to figure out what that sample in the middle of the fridge actually has in it and we can go back and figure out how it was made and what the importance of it is. Uh, we plate phage a lot, so a lot of pipetting. Uh, we count little dots on plates a lot because that's how we figure out how much phage we have in our sample. So you can see uh, lots of plates. And yeah, and so that's pretty much it. Um, you can see all the students that have worked for me since I've been here. We collaborate with New England Biolabs, which, which is in Ipswich, Mass. And uh, I have a collaborator there. We go visit the, the company. It's a beautiful building. We go on tours and it's really fun. And Chris is a great collaborator. We talk to him a lot about our research. And this is a picture of their building. So and here are the sources of funding. And thank you all for your attention.